Now we come to Professor uh, C.K. Raju's talk, Ganit versus Formal Mathematics. We've all had occasion to listen to Professor Raju from his extremely reasoned arguments to his impassioned rants calling for a decolonization of world mathematics. It's not just Indian mathematics. Of course, we are a special sufferers, according to him. He's tried numerous times to penetrate into that fortress called the NCERT. And he's also put up rewards using his own money and challenges anybody. I think the reward is still open. I'm told it's unclaimed. It's two lakhs for anyone who can prove that Euclid existed. And Professor Raju has done enormous research to show us that the first references to Euclid appear only in the 11th century, and that uh, mostly from the Catholic Church. Anyhow, I won't get into the nitty gritty. I will leave it to him. I'm not competent in mathematics, but I can see that uh, somehow what he calls formal mathematics versus formal mathematics, the idea of a natural Ganit arising out of Prakriti from which we also rose up from the swamps is somehow appealing to me, you know. And if we can make it work in today's world and make math less, uh, should I say, user unfriendly to the young, I think it will be a great service and it will also resurrect a very important part of our Indian knowledge systems, which are not properly understood till this date. So with these words, Professor Raju, I invite you. I also want to mention that uh, uh, we are planning a farewell uh, for, for fellows tomorrow. We are sorry you're not in our midst, but it's just as well you should be safe. And your, your stroke and partial para paralytic attack was very shocking to me. I consider you... Uh, I really, you're a genius. I've said it many times. I don't mind saying it one more time. And you've had a difficult time because people don't understand you. And, uh, you know, there's very little sympathy in our society for anybody who's ex exceptionally gifted, you know. But we miss you here. But what I want to say is if you can join us in the farewell tomorrow online, I'll be grateful. And we can convey the shawl and topi to you at the right occasion. So with those words, Professor Raju, over to you. Okay, Professor Raju. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I must thank the Institute for having invited me for uh, taking up this Tagore Fellowship, and particularly Professor Makaran Paranjpe. And I'm very grateful to you, uh, Professor Singh, for agreeing to chair this session. I invited you because we keep having discussions on the history and philosophy of science, which is what this is about. We had so many discussions for uh, one whole year on the dining table. Okay, you are able to see it? Yes. All right. Okay, so uh, let me start with that. As you see, the uh, topic is uh, Ganit versus formal mathematics. The idea is that the two are not the same, and it will take a long time to explain why. But you will see some part of it as we go on. So let me start with a little story. You know, I was selected for IITG, and I did not join. And of course, uh, here's my uh, selection letter. I put it up when I saw this um, idiots and IIT. And uh, then this is when I did join. And uh, uh, are you seeing the screen? Screen clear? Is it visible or not? It is, but uh, we've skipped the first slide. I think you should scroll up to the appointment letter. We can't see that. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I just, 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 uh, I just want to take this off and I go on to go back to this. I just wanted to say that I did not join, and I did join IIT for a math uh, PhD in Delhi. And I attended one class and asked one question, and they had no answer. And the teacher said he didn't know any mathematics, so I left. And because I had this kind of bad experience with IIT, I advised my children not to join. And my elder son, he was an Olympiad. He uh, attended this Padova Olympiad, and he got this special prize, which is equivalent to a gold medal. 
and uh, after that you see the other people he got it for using regular falsi that's a latin name but it's a ganit method which i taught him and the other members of the olympiad team were all toppers iitg toppers and so after that he when he joined st stephens he was very unhappy that his fellow physics physics students were all iit rejects so he thought he had come down in the world you know where he is with the toppers and suddenly you know he is now with all the rejects so after his graduation he got admission in all the uh, top us universities harvard mit caltech and so on but i was very reluctant to send him at that age but then he said no one in du knows any physics all they understand is where you did your phd from they are not going to judge you by uh, what you say but where you are coming from what is your social standing so far as uh, your phd is concerned and i knew he was right because i was having uh, quite a lot of interaction with the delhi university physics department at that time penrose had come and there was a dis um, discussion debate and so on so i had no answer to him and so he went on now the point i am making is that two centuries ago colonial education came supposedly for science but even today almost nobody in our top universities knows any math or science it's a very shabby state of affairs and any child knows this and all they understand is where you got your certificate of western approval from and so the point is colonial education apparently came for science but that story differs from the facts and any child knows that and that is something which is a key uh, point which uh, i would be uh, uh, trying to address that the story diverges from the facts of colonial education and why is that all right so let me give a quick twitter summary of the book that ganit differs from math because you might translate it as math and it makes math very easy people have this huge difficulty with math and that goes away i want to tell you why and it makes science better it's not just a matter of pedagogy it's a matter of practical value it makes science better and now i am not just rooting in favor of ganit i am saying there is something drastically wrong with formal math we need to bury it and what i am presenting today is something i would call an obituary of formal math it's not merely that ganit is better but that formal math is very bad it should be disposed of finished off and i don't know why people are continuing with it all right so the slogan formulation would be that formal math is dead and of course long live normal math all right now let's go to the book enough of twitter and slogan formulations so it has four parts the introductory part then the part 2 is on the false history and superstitions of western formal mathematics it's not merely false history the superstitions that go with it then part 3 is about the alternative of pedagogy what one can teach and part 4 is the alternative of what new science one can do that is the one which has taken me the maximum amount of time on this fellowship so let me go with part 1 just two chapters the first is about colonial education which i have been talking to you earlier it is church education and i want to repeat it because i think this point is not being sufficiently well emphasized and it came on the propaganda of civilizational superiority which is very similar to racism extremely similar it is in fact organically linked because both are based on the same false history and chapter 2 is just an a quick introduction to the whole theme of ganit versus formal mathematics in our plan so let me come to chapter 1 i won't cover all of them but i'll cover some of them i think one chapter one needs to be um, covered because of the dogma of civilizational superiority so uh, we have macaulay 1.0 which is uh, basically that minute one education and he is blamed for bringing colonial education in india but he said that indians needed western education for science because his point was that you are able to see this uh, thing are you able to see this uh, because sometimes you are not able to see and uh, i just want to be sure may i have some feedback is it visible yes, yes sir, sir it is visible. totally visible okay thank you yes, so this yes, is what you said the text very clearly thank you 
the superiority of the when it comes to science and you know hard things the superiority of the europeans becomes absolutely immeasurable this is what he said and you can collect all the books in the sanskrit language and so on in fact all the books in the arabic as well and they will not amount to anything so he had a very very poor opinion of what was available but what i want to say is we can't keep blaming macaulay this is completely wrong why because macaulay was not a plot against india colonial education went to all colonies whether they were french portuguese dutch and the education in his time western education was 100% church monopoly and that includes all the higher education universities such as paris cambridge and i'm showing you the original sources this is for the establishment of paris university that uh, you know it is the uh, chancellor will be appointed and at the time of his installation in the presence of the bishop or in the command of the latter so the chancellor is set up by the pope and is to be uh, is uh, uh, subordinate to the bishop now no historian or educationist has put this fact on the table it needs to be on the table all right you have accepted church education why have we accepted it and this is not merely a case of india it went to all colonies and it went on the strength of the same church propaganda of civilization of superiority which was earlier race superiority which was earlier religious superiority next point i want to make uh, so church education of course provide some uh, practical value but it injects some poison and i want to bring to your attention macaulay version 2.0 and uh, i have a little article on that uh, on education and counter revolution this is the speech that macaulay made in parliament 100000 people rise in its insurrection and so on and the parliament is besieged your predecessor sits trembling in his chair and so on this is a revolt that he's talking about and he is saying that the state is not a hangman and you can't just hang people after the fact you must prevent this from happening and how do you prevent it from happening the way to do so is to educate them because you never saw and educate them for free the state sponsored free education to stop the uh, revolt and why is that because it's church education that was designed to create missionaries it makes the educated very submissive and receptive to propaganda and hence prevents revolt so this is like racism i am not drawing a wild analogy they are both based on the same false history it's a mutation you know you might call it a double mutation or a triple mutation from religious superiority to race superiority to civilization superiority i won't go into the entire theory of this i have put up the paper all online but they are all based on the same false history of science created by the church and used also by macaulay and this false history is a traditional church weapon ever since the 4th century when the church married the state and it sought to generate power through superstitions and lies it started writing false history you have eusebius and you have orosius history against the pagans but that was long time back the false history of science and that's all that i want to talk about when ballistic during the crusades in the 10th 12th century to the 15th century okay 11th century also but uh, maybe i mean that should be 11th century probably okay but no historian in india ever talked of false western history no one did the history of history why not don't they have the courage to speak out don't they have the knowledge of it so i think this is very problematic i'll just summarize it quickly the knowledge in captured arabic texts captured or imported arabic texts euclid was both captured and imported was appropriated by indiscriminately attributing those arabic texts to early greeks real or imaginary and these greeks were initially declared as friends of christians that was when the doctrine of religious superiority was going on later they were declared as whites because uh, when race uh, superiority came into place it was just a little change of categories and then they were declared as west so when uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, slaves 
they were slaved uh, because they were not Christian. And when they turned, they became Christian, they had to change the categories and say that they are inferior because they are not white and so on. And then uh, when the uh, Aryan race thesis came, they changed it to civilization of superiority. Then the second part of the false history that all early stuff is due to the Greeks. Everything early is due to the Greeks. And the second part is the doctrine of Christian discovery. Everything that happened after the so-called Renaissance, that all indigenous scientific knowledge across the world was appropriated by attributing it to Christian discoverers. There is this video of mine. You could take a look at discovery of India. Uh, just Google it. I think I'll skip it. But it's about the doctrine of Christian discovery. And you can see an example of uh, science being all due to Christian before and after. Greeks were French of Christians, and afterwards they were all Christians or whites or West. So you have this uh, little booklet of mine. As you can see, they are all uh, Christians and they're all hanging, hanging upside down. I won't go further into that. I hope you get the gist of it. A key example that I will look at is the claim that Newton and Leibniz discovered calculus. Just as Vasco da Gama discovered India. We were there, we did not exist. No, it's not just that. There is a US Supreme Court judgment that prior occupancy of the land by millions of people. All right, so long as they are non-Christians does not make any legal discovery difference to discovery. And I learned this as part of history, Vasco da Gama discovered India. That was my first lesson in history. And that's a US Supreme Court judgment. And you can find the reference to it here. If you go down the meaning of Christian discovery, this is the one Johnson and Graham Rassi. This is still currently active, this Supreme Court judgment. So do take a look at it. All right. And we accept it because it's part of the uh, British laws and there's a long uh, reasoning given by the judge. Now I want to correct this cliche that history is written by victors. I want to say that false history is written by would be victors. Because history is a source of power. The lies of history are a source of power. Of course, it's of a nonviolent sort, but it is greatly needed by the militarily weak crusading church and by colonialists, colonizers who feared revolt all the time because they were so few and there were millions of people around them who could knock them off. So that is the summary of chapter one. That church education, it's not Macaulay, it is church education which was exported to all colonies, claiming it was needed for science. Note this connection between church and science. Using the dogma of civilizational superiority, racist superiority, religious superiority, which was this, so the secular justification for the dogma was a false history of science erected by, by the church. We did everything, so imitate us. All right, so this has misled and enslaved people. And through stories of science, all you got was stories of science. You have heard the story of Copernicus. Nobody has read a word of what Copernicus wrote. What kind of mistakes he made? Nobody knows. Try Cobrahe. What kind of mistakes he made? Kepler and so on. Newton for that matter. I'll talk about Newton. So you were not taught science. You were only taught stories of science in order to enslave you, in order to make you worship the West. All right, so let me now move on to chapter two. This is just a quick background, and since I have covered it uh, earlier, I won't uh, go into too much detail. Let's go into Ganit versus formal math. There are two parts to it. First part is history, the other part is philosophy. So the history part is that most present day school math, or practical math, arithmetic, algebra, trigonometry, calculus, probability, and statistics, except for geometry. It was imported by Europeans from India between 10th and 17th centuries. Directly or indirectly. May have come by Arabs, may have come by Africa and whatever. But uh, that was the, uh, it was done for its practical value for commerce, navigation, gambling, etc. So due to cultural differences in maths, Europeans made hilarious blunders for centuries about the imported Indian guns. For example, there's the Pope's abacus that I told you about already. I've shown this to you, which is about Arabic numerals. 
and uh, this is uh, the whole idea of building an abac abacus. Because Indian, you were learnt in primary school that Indian uh, arithmetic is done algorithmically. You have an algorithm for multiplication or division. You don't choose an abacus. There was uh, the law against uh, zero that Florence passed. You know, numbers should also be written in words and so on because they didn't understand zeros because the numerals were additive. There were Newton's fluxions. Now, that's a bit hard to explain. I'll try to explain that. Now, let me go on to part two. I'm just giving you a very summary uh, a summary, and all the references and details you will find in the uh, link that has been sent. So mathematics varies with culture. Therefore, Ganit is not equal to math. And the key cultural tension between Ganit and Western or formal math, I use the terms interchangeably, is this, that Ganit was always practical and secular. Western math was always religious since Plato, Professor Singh mentioned Plato. Yes, he put it on par with music. And uh, that is the connection he tried to draw, that both of them arouse the soul. And I want to give this example of one plus one equal to two. What is the difference between Ganit and formal math at the level of one plus one equal to two? So that's where people want to know. So if you do it in Ganit, it's very simple. This is the way you did it in uh, your uh, uh, kindergarten, right? Empirically. But if you try to do it in formal math, it is extremely complicated. And uh, remember, and this is from Bertrand Russell, Principia. And he takes 378 pages, as you know, to prove this. The point is that you don't understand this. I mean, I taught my son, elder son, once to write mathematics like this without a word of English. And he did it, and he took it to school, where uh, they thought that it was uh, something uh, very fantastic, because they didn't understand it. So the point is that there is a vast amount of difference between the way you do 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in Ganit and in formal mathematics. But this is only the beginning. If you want to do science, you want to do calculus, you want to do 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in real numbers. And 1 as a real number is not the same thing as 1 as a natural number in formal mathematics. The two are not the same. So this is my Cape Town challenge, which I gave. Recently, I announced a prize of rupees 1 million to the faculty of JNU to prove 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in real numbers within uh, one day. And 1 lakh, if it, they did it within one week, nobody claimed it. And here is the video, which is the proof of that. Maybe you take a look at it. Um, this is taking a lot of time. Okay, that's the link. This is a, the video is online, so do take a look at it. And this happened uh, some not so very long back. So the point is that you have, this is your best university, one of your best universities at least. And you are, I'm talking to professors there. And I'm asking them to prove 1 plus 1 equal to 2. And they are professors of mathematics education. And they don't know it. I'm offering 10 lakh rupees. They don't know it. Not a single person comes forward. And so the point is that Colonial education has made you all mathematically illiterate. It may have come with the promise of teaching you science, but it has ended up making you mathematically illiterate. Now, that may be acceptable to you. You may continue to believe it came for your uh, benefit. I don't want to humiliate anybody. I just want to wake you up to some very unpleasant facts. If you didn't learn why, why 1 plus 1 equal to 2, what science did you possibly learn? I think you need to reflect about it. The point is, I and mean, this is my definition of superstition, it is being firmly convinced that whatever you're doing is right, though you're totally ignorant of why it is being done. So whatever way math is being taught must be right. So you don't know what is happening. That is superstition because it works to your disadvantage and it is something which is harmful. And this is not the kind of superstition that any of our rationalists talks about. But this is the superstition we came from the church. It is equally a superstition. Now, let me ask this question. Why is 1 plus 1 equal to 2 so difficult in formal math? And now, if it is so difficult, did you get any advantage from it? Or let me put it in another way. If you don't know it, did you get any disadvantage from it? 
all your life, I mean, many of us are so very old. Did you get any disadvantage from not knowing this axiomatic proof 378 page for natural numbers or 1000 pages for real numbers? Did you get any disadvantage from not knowing it? I think you carried on your life perfectly well, then why do you need it? So if it has no practical value, why are we teaching this nonsense? And that's the question that I'm really asking. And it has just teaching it because colonial education is church education, which teaches church math. So what is church math? I think that's the next question. And I have already told this story of how the crusading church changed. Uh, this is uh, the book, um, Euclid and Jesus. This is the subtitle. How and why the church changed mathematics and Christianity across two religious wars. And I'm happy to let you know that a Spanish uh, version of this is translation of this is coming out. And I did invite the translator, but I don't know if he's here. But the point is, the story has not been understood. People think the church is about Christianity, not about mathematics. What is mathematics to do with the church? So you have to go through the church theology of reason. So the church was fighting the crusades to convert the Muslims. And it could not do that because its force was not sufficient. It was militarily weak. And therefore, it needed another way to persuade them. And so it could not persuade them using the Bible. So it persuaded them using reason because of, there was an Islamic theology of reason or Akli Kalam. And so it wanted to compete with that. All right. So uh, how to do that? How to adopt reason? You see, the point is the church made a terrific innovation. It could go with facts. Normally, when you talk of reason, you say, OK, there is smoke, and therefore there is fire. Now, smoke, seeing smoke is a fact. But it's not that kind of reason. Because if you bring in facts, they are extremely embarrassing uh, to church dogmas. You know, you're talking about virgin birth or whatever. You know, where is the question of facts? You're talking about heaven or hell or God. No question of facts. So the church rejected facts, rejected empirical proofs. We accepted all Indian systems of philosophy accept, but the church rejected it. And this was the novelty. Everywhere in the world it is accepted, but the church rejected it. Your mic is on. So what the church did was to invent metaphysical reasoning or reasoning minus facts, or what is also called axiomatic reasoning. You do not begin from facts, you begin from axioms. And then it says this is superior. So axioms are more convenient than facts, because you can assume anything you like. Because an axiom is not a self-evident truth. It's an assumption, it's a postulate. And anything can be assumed as a postulate. For example, when Aquinas, who was one of the major uh, theologians at that time, he reasoned about angels. There are no facts about angels, but he has axiomatically assumed that they occupy no space. This is in Summa Theologica. In my last presentation, I've given you a reference. And therefore, the church adopted a new holy book. Because this was the method. It had, had to have a holy book. And this holy book was an Arabic text which came to Europe around 1125 CE during the Crusades. And it was attributed to an unknown Greek Euclid. It may be Euclides, key to geometry or whatever. It may mean anything, but there is no Euclid that is known. But it was claimed, we are not really so much concerned about Euclid. It was claimed that this text used axiomatic reasoning in geometry. So that is how the church fits in to geometry. It said, this is the model of reasoning. This is a glorified, this is a great form of reasoning without facts. It's a superior form of reasoning. And we believed it. So this was the claim that it made about the book. The book is there. Euclid may or may not be there, but the book is certainly there. And the book does not use axiomatic reasoning. This is just some nonsense that the church talked and everybody believed. So the church interpretation of it became the norm for Western mathematics. And Western formal mathematics became metaphysics. Maybe you can read Russell's essay on mathematics and the metaphysicians. It is complete mathematics. Uh, it's complete metaphysics, formal mathematics. No facts. Now, let me go back to history. We uh, said that uh, Europe imported most practical math from India. And it could not throw away. The practical value was enormous. But it could not accept it because it had different views on mathematics. And so it adapted it to its native understanding of mathematics by adding metaphysics of no practical value. 
But that metaphysics of no practical value, you saw how difficult it makes even one plus one equal to two. Then it gave the package that, uh, you know, false history, Newton discovered calculus and so on. And uh, it's a superior thing to do, to do it metaphysically. And this was returned to us through colonial education. And we learn it without questioning, without being able to question it. And this is still being taught today in our schools and universities. This is the kind of math which is taught. And that is what I'm questioning. So our historians won't contest that false history and our philosophers won't contest that bad, bad philosophy. So somebody has to do it, so I'm doing it. So we need to understand and reject both the false history and the bad philosophy and its false claim of superiority, which is exactly like the racist claim of superiority, whites are superior to blacks, and nobody questioned it. And there was slavery for so many centuries and there was apartheid which just ended. So uh, it's a great shame that we have not uh, uh, done either in two centuries and we refuse to do so today. NCRT says we cannot check it, we will not check it, you must believe whatever is written in Western texts and Wikipedia and so on. I think that is very bad, it's horrible. So anyway, the propaganda which is used to maintain this package of false history and bad philosophy is that there are propagandist misrepresentations of Ganit. That only Greeks use reasoning. This is what our class nine text says, or what Pope Benedict says. So I won't go into Benedict's maledicts, but this is complete nonsense because Indians inferred that the earth is round. You know, so you have this, for example, uh, uh, text by um, uh, it's in uh, Aryabhat. To see goal six, why is it taking so long? I don't know. Okay, so uh, the very word bhugol, you know, is about to a goal. And uh, he's very clearly saying that the uh, globe of the Earth stands supportless in space. It is not supported by Atlas or anybody else. All right. So Earth is round. It was inferred. Obviously, Aryabhat did not did not go to say space and see no rockets. And why? How was it inferred from the observation that far off trees cannot be seen? So this is from Lal. As he says, if you say that the earth is flat, then explain why you can't see far off trees, even though they are very tall. And uh, this is in Shikshadhi Vridhid. And um, well, you can actually calculate the size of the earth from this observation of how far off you are able to see. And my students did it for my HPS course. So these are my students from a history, philosophy of science course in Al-Bukhari University. I took them to um, the sea, near the sea, on a day near Equinox, and they measured the Earth themselves. And they realized how easy it is, but the Europeans were not able to do it because they did not have enough understanding of math. So the second kind of propagandist thing is that, of course, Ganit accepts empirical proofs. All schools of Indian thought accept uh, protects pronoun as does science but if you accept uh, and therefore uh, empirical proof it accepted also in ganit for example here is uh, a verse from aryabhat sadhya jalen sambhu udvam lambake naiva so you level ground is to be measured by tested by water work it, verticality by means of a plumb line mm -hmm. now this is obviously the way your mystery does it now uh, they might say this is inferior, it is what an artisan does, but this okay. is the way you do things practically. And it's fallacious to imagine that if you accept the empirical, then you reject reason. It's like saying, okay, Kosambi uh, did mathematics, so how could you do history? Or if he did history, how could you do mathematics? That is what Homi Baba said when he sacked him. So uh, the other kind of misrepresentation is that um, Indian Ganit lack proof. It's completely another kind of nonsense. I've given this example for the last 20 years. There is a proof of the Pythagorean proposition, very clearly available. And uh, the only thing is it involves empirical proof. It's an empirical proof as well. You have to draw the diagram, cut, move things around and so on. And then you see that the two areas are equal. So it's an empirical process. But there is a double speak about reason. You know, people think reason is normal reason, reason plus facts. I see smoke, I infer fire. But when the formal mathematician talks of reason, he means church reason, which is reason minus facts. There are no facts anywhere, only axioms. So uh, the problem is that when you derive theorems in this manner, these theorems are not valid knowledge. 
So you know the Aquinas Angel Theorem. So you have, uh, I don't know why it becomes so slow. So he's talking about number of angels which fit on the head of a pin and he's proceeding axiomatically because you have no facts about angels. So you can draw any nonsense conclusion, any nonsense proposition whatsoever can be proved axiomatically as a mathematical theorem. Just make it or something equivalent to it an axiom. And so let me give another example. Pythagorean theorem is not valid knowledge. Why is it not valid knowledge? If you are on the curved surface of the earth, then if you look at triangles, they are going to be curved. It's not going to be valid. It's not valid in the real world. Now you say, okay, going through space. Of course, it's not valid in space either because uh, it is uh, space is also curved. All right. So it is not valid anywhere in the world. Now people will say, okay, it is approximately true, but it's not good to say, you can't say it is approximate knowledge because approximate knowledge must come with an error estimate. If you don't have an error estimate, no use saying it's approximate. It's like saying, you know, somebody is drowning in sea. You say, okay, you are approximately near land. Now, what does approximation mean? 30 meters? Hmm? If it is 30 meters, he might live. Ah, my hand is not working properly. Uh, but if it means uh, 300 kilometers, then he's going to die. So it's no good saying approximate. I don't know what's the degree of approximation. All right. So Indian Ganit preferred inexact calculations, not true. And it understood these limitations. For example, you have the Mahabhaskariya, which says this about uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the curvature of the earth. And he's talking, by the way, of the Ganit Vid, who are the... Uh, Disciples of the Bhatta. So um, he's saying that he says the Pythagorean theorem is gross, and due to the disciples of the Bhatta, and same thing about the curvature of the earth is also stated in the Lagu Bhaskarian. Uh, I don't know why these things are taking so long to come up. What is the reason for uh, this slowing down? So he calls it stool because the karna is stool, the distance is stool, and uh, the curvature of the earth, vakra. All right, I think I should um, take this off. There are too many probably windows open. Let me close them all. Otherwise, it will slow down. All right. So uh, we have this understanding that the Pythagorean theorem does not apply on the curved surface of the earth. And we find this in the seventh century with the Bhas with Bhaskar one. But Westerners didn't understand this. They didn't understand this till the 17th century. They were drowning by the thousands. Because they thought Pythagorean theorem, it must be exact. The theorem, exactly true, it's eternal truth. And they had no error estimate because they could not measure the curvature of the earth. They thought the earth is that flat. That's what the Bible says. So in India, it was done differently. What was done? You had Pythagorean theorem, uh, calculations, not a theorem. You calculate the diagonal of a rectangle from the knowledge of its two sides. And you calculate the sides from a knowledge of the diagonal and the angle that it makes from one of the sides. Both ways you go. From the sides to the diagonal, from the diagonal to the sides, which is today called trigonometry. It is trigonometric uh, triangle. It's not a triangle, it's a rectangle. So uh, Manas Strudo Sutra states the first version, which is uh, stated, you know, I am, it's again for a rectangle, if you see. I am a Mayamam Gunam, Vistaram Vistarentu, Samatya Varga Mulam, Yatat Karnata Vido Vido. So that's the, you have to multiply the length by the length. Not the important thing is Samatya Varga Mulam. It's a square root. When you take the square root, then you don't uh, have uh, exactitude. And you know how to calculate square roots. They were known in India. They were known to Egyptians. They were known to Iraqis, but they were not known to the West. The very word for square root, you know, if you take square root of two, it is called a sod. Why? Because it comes from bad kernel. You're looking at the diagonal. Diagonal is karna, and kernel is also ear. So when you say bad karna, you mean, mean bad ear, and that was translated to death, which is sardus in Latin, and therefore sard. That is why you call root to a sard. So square roots can be calculated precisely, but not exactly. 
and in fact, the Strudel Sutra name for it, uh, square root of two, as in the Bodhan Strudel Sutra, is Savishesha with an Avshesh, right? So uh, that is a very word for square root of two. And then you have uh, this table of precise sign values by Aryabhata. This is not Sanskrit. This is only one word of Sanskrit, which is Kalal Kalarjya. Uh, Kala is minutes, sexagesimal minutes, and Ardhaja is his word for sign, that is from Gitika 10. And from Ja, you get Jiva, which when it goes into Arabic becomes Jiba and from is misread as Jib. And Oxford English Dictionary will tell you that this is where sinus comes from, and that is how you get the word sign. The sign values too cannot be exactly calculated. So inexact calculation is what I'm talking about and one of the characteristic features of the kernel. And I'm saying that inexact calculation or inexact knowledge in the real world is preferable to a theorem which pretends to be exact knowledge, but only in an imagined world, in an unreal world. So inexact knowledge in the real world, preferable to exact knowledge in a Harry Potter world. All right, so let me come to part two, which is about the false history and the superstitions of Western formal mathematics. So the false history of mathematics Critical uh, is Pythagoras, Euclid, and geometry, and then Newton and Leibniz. Of course, there's a lot of false history to cover. I'll cover only these two in the book. And then there's a question of superstitions of formal math. The formal math, I mean, superstitions are not something which stay in some temple. They are right there in your textbook, in NCRT textbooks. Okay, so that's the politics of uh, reason and the fallibility of deduction. And then uh, there is also uh, the question of the, uh, are you able to see this? Uh, this is much more complicated. I won't go into that. Politics of eternity and the metaphysics of infinity. Whole lot of mathematics is based on the metaphysics of infinity. I won't be going, or formal mathematics is based on that. I won't be going into that. So let's just look at Pythagoras and Euclid, because that's where the dogma of Western Civilizational superiority in mathematics is based. And uh, that there was Pythagoras and he proved a theorem. And um, just to prove the linkage, to indicate the linkage of this dogma to racist superiority, our class nine school text shows images of them as white skinned males, both Pythagoras and Euclid. How on earth do they know it? But they want to make the point that it's the white man who is superior. And this point is being made without saying so, because saying so would be offensive, but you can show an image. So to break this dogma, it is necessary to smash these myths bits of Pythagoras and Euclid. So of course, there is no primary evidence for Pythagoras or for the color of his skin, or that he proved any theorem or how he proved it. But there is plenty of counter evidence. It's not mere absence of evidence. It is presence of counter evidence. Because the Pythagoreans were a religious sect, they were interested, they were not interested in proving metaphysical theorems like the church. They were interested in arousing the soul because Egyptian mystery geometry about which Plato talks. All right. In Plato Meno, I think I have shown you this earlier, and you just have to Google Plato Meno and see the connection of geometry to the soul. And I won't go into that again. Now, the point I'm making is that Western historians, so called, are myths jumpers. When you challenge their myth, so I challenge the myth of Pythagoras, what will they do if it is exposed? They will jump to the myth of Euclid. Oh, you have to go to Euclid. All right, of course, there is no evidence of Euclid. So I made this, issued this uh, challenge prize 10 years ago in the presence of the Malaysian uh, Deputy Education Minister. And there is this video where I have made this, uh, announced this prize. And so you can take a look, it is recorded. And I won't show you the video, of course, you can just check it out. It's called Goodbye Euclid. Uh, nobody has claimed it. And NCRT said, we don't have evidence, you just have, we don't need it. Why do you need primary evidence? You don't need primary evidence of Western history, you have to believe it. That is your task as a colonized subject. Okay, so anyway, the point is that there's, forget about Euclid, there is no evidence that he was the author of the book attributed to him. No evidence that the book was written any time near the date attributed to him. And of course, no evidence that he was a white male. And again, plenty of counter evidence. So I have, as you know, put forward the thesis that the author was a black woman from Africa. And uh, this is argued out here. 
and it is in my uh, cover of my book euclid and jesus so you can take a look this i put up after the indology meeting why because um, i'll tell you in a minute the book was written in the fifth century that's about 800 years after the supposed date of euclid it was written for a different purpose it's a book on egyptian mystery geometry it is obvious if you read it and because it's a book on egyptian mystery geometry which involves notions of the soul it enraged the church and so the author was lynched and raped in a church most horribly but now the point is when you point that out there is no euclid there is another jump. The jump is to the myth of the book. See, this happened at the Indology Roundtable in March. Author does not matter. Does not matter whether she is he or she or white or black. Book is there. All right, book is there. But these greedy I call them greedy because they never read the book. They just think that the book is there and you say book is there and you will get the proof of the myth. There is not a single axiomatic proof in the book. It's total myth. So just say book is there, book is there, what book is there? And it is well known for the last hundred years that there is not a single axiomatic proof in the book. But Western scholars were hegemonized by the church, so they kept believing for 750 years that the book has axiomatic proof. And the final proof of that is that Cambridge University made a foolish exam regulation about Euclid in the year 1888. That this, this, this would be required, Euclid's axioms postulate, it's a very foolish thing. And I don't have time to explain because they say it, they put up a book which is full of empirical proofs. And if you have empirical proofs, then the order of the theorems doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, you know to say that um, you, uh, there should be you must follow the order of the uh, propositions in the in Euclid. No proof of any proposition occurring in Euclid should be accepted in which a subsequent proposition of Euclid is assumed. So you have to follow the order. This is an exam regulation in Cambridge University. And it is such a stupid, foolish thing. But nobody in India has the courage to stand up and say that Cambridge did something so foolish. After 700 years of uh, that book, they never read it. And they produced a book, which was totally contrary to this. They just went by the myth. And the book is also online. This comment is also online. So there are no such axiomatic proofs in the book. Not a single axiomatic proof, not the very first proposition, not the last. It's a total myth. So no point pointing to the book. The book has no axiomatic proofs. And this is publicly known for at least a century. So dead kind, Russell and Hinberg. The no, very first proposition lacks an axiomatic proof. It has an empirical proof. <laughs> it is about erecting an equilateral triangle on a given line segment. So you draw two arcs and where they intersect, you join. But how do they intersect? You see them intersect. That's an empirical proof. All right, there is no axiom in the book which tells you that they will intersect. And so what did Dedekind do? He invented that. But anyway, this is what uh, Russell said. So maybe I quote authority that it's a tissue of nonsense. So maybe we search for tissue. So tissue of nonsense, both proposition, the tissue of nonsense. And all this is known for the last hundred years. He's writing around uh, 1900. And what is more, is the whole book, Foundations of Geometry, I put it online, by Hilbert, was written to supply the axiomatic proofs which are missing in the book. Why do you write? Because they are not there. And of course, he force fitted the book to the myth. He rewrote it. And he did great violence to the original by inventing what is called synthetic geometry. I won't go into that right now. But the point is, this false myth of civilizational superiority is so deeply entrenched in the Western psyche that the best Western historians, your Gillings, your Needham, your Kaget, Needham, such a big name, he talks this nonsense that there are formal proofs in, the, uh, in Euclid, and why didn't the Chinese follow it? We were so great, our civilizational superiority, all based on myth. And not a single person is willing to stand up and say this is complete nonsense that Needham has written. Because there are no axiomatic proofs in uh, Euclid. Even a century after it has been exposed, they keep repeating this myth because they know that there are enough people who will keep believing it, who will never check it. So anyway, even if you have such a thing, the Pythagorean theorem is inferior knowledge, the Pythagorean calculation, as I've already pointed out. So let me go to the uh, politics of reason and the fallibility of deduction. 
Now, the point is, Dedekind, Russell, and Hilbert, they exposed the absence of axiomatic proofs in Euclid. But they founded formal mathematics on the belief that axiomatic proofs are superior. So they rejected the myth, but they accepted the superstition. And these are supposed to be the big brains in the West. Hilbert was the best mathematician around. General theory of relativity comes from him, not Einstein. And of course, Russell got the Nobel Prize and so on. I don't have to tell you about that. So question to ask is, why are axiomatic proofs superior? Because they serve just purposes. I already told you that, that um, church couldn't accept facts. And so it went by axioms. And because it served these purposes, it glorified axiomatic proofs and hegemonized Europeans and hegemonized colonials, uh, colonized minds believed it. So what is the philosophical claim that deductive proofs are superior because they are infallible? All right, this is complete nonsense. But that is the basis of formal math. Why is it complete nonsense? Any math teacher knows that students make mistakes. Every student has so many mistakes they make in any given proof. You ask them, I was when I used to teach. This to be, I used to have to correct hundreds, I mean, not hundreds, I had 60 students in the class. But there used to be so many people who used to make mistakes. Almost nobody got it right. And so they all plunk. But authorities also make mistakes. For example, Kosambi published the wrong proof of the Riemann hypothesis. And many people like that. Ratia did the same thing. So now it's no, you can't dodge by saying that a valid deductive proof is infallible because that's an irrefutable tautology. Anything valid is valid, is infallible. And a valid empirical proof is also infallible. Point is to determine validity. How do you determine validity? So given that there are errors in a deductive proof, Validity can only be decided by rechecking. When I do a calculation, I had a 110 page calculation to do for my PhD thesis. And I had to repeat it over uh, months. Because each time you repeat it, maybe it goes wrong again. Maybe that's a new mistake. So you have to do it repeatedly. But anyway, that's an inductive process. Okay, that's all that I'm saying. Or you have to trust an authority. Oh, so and so said it's right, therefore it is right. Such as the infallible Pope. So when authorities differ, and they do differ, for example, I may say do calculus without real numbers, and somebody may say do it with real and most people will say do it with real numbers, what do you do? You go by their social reputation. Oh, who is this guy? We don't know him. Okay. Therefore, its truth is decided by assuming that society is a utopia. That is some infallibility. In either case, the point I'm making is that deduction is weaker than induction or empirical proof. Just now, there's a proof theorem which was proved. And there's a big ruckus about it. And now some Japanese chats are saying, oh, you see this guy's social reputation is this. That is how you prove the infallibility of deduction. I mean, it is a comedy or tragedy of errors. I don't know what. Now I want to make the point that not only is it not infallible, it is more fallible, more frequently fallible than empirical proof. Because the human mind is more easily deceived than the human senses. So if you have a complex task of deduction, it almost invariably almost invariably involves error. I'm sorry, my speech is a bit slurred, so please pardon that. So uh, the game of chess is pure deduction. Okay, if you have an error-free game, it must end in a draw. But every human being, every human being without exception in the world, almost always does, and therefore loses to a machine, he can never draw. Get the topmost grandmaster, get the world champion, he will lose. And if he ends in a draw, that will be a great victory for him because he makes an error. Because deduction is frequently variable. All right, then there are many other issues. You see, logic is not culturally unique. Church learned about uh, logic from the, they say it's Aristotle, but they learned it from the Arabic texts of Ibn Rushd and Al-Ghazali, of course. And therefore, they thought that logic is unique and it binds God, that is what they said. But therefore, true value logic is what is used in mathematical proof. But uh, ah, logic depends upon, this is my paper on uh, non-Western log logic in the Springer Encyclopedia. Logic depends, uh, in Indian culture, there were logics which were not even truth functional, like Buddhist, Chatushkoti, or Jain Kyadwar. So there is a reference to my paper. You can look that up. I've been making this point for quite some time. So it is just a cultural truth. 
mathematical theorems cannot be anything better than a cultural truth if you just say this is my culture which asks for it and therefore i impose this logic act in mathematics because if you change the logic the theorems of mathematics will change you know if you have buddhist chatushkoti then proofs of contradiction will fail and you will not be able to prove for example the ex existence of a lebeg non measurable set logic is also not empirically unique i'm not arguing from culture alone because physics at the microphysical level is modeled by quantum mechanics and quantum logic is not even proof functional it's very much like buddhist logic anyway empirically logic is not certain is it going to be two valued can you have schrodinger's cat both dead and alive at one instant of time so <laughs> you have to decide logic how will you decide if you decide empirically then deductive proofs are decidedly weaker than empirical proofs so the conclusion is that the purported in infallibility of deductive proofs is a mere church superstition metaphysical proofs are more convenient to the church politically convenient though they are decidedly inferior for practical applications such as quantum mechanics now let me go to the question of science i will come back to pedagogy at the end i don't know how much time i have got so let me want, i want to look at newton and gravitation which is chapter 4 and chapter 11 So calculus originated in India with the fifth century Aryabhat, who was a Dalit from Patna, and he calculated 24 sine values precise to the first sexagesimal minute. I think I already showed you that uh, words of his, which is maki bhaki bhaki that is all. It is all numbers, and the only Sanskrit term here is kalar dajja. So uh, they are accurate to kala. Kala is first sexagesimal. Uh, play uh, minute and uh, therefore it is uh, about five decimal places how did he do it he did it numerically you don't do it geometrically if you ask anybody today they'll say opposite side upon hypotenuse complete nonsense all my students when i run a pretest they all repeat that nonsense completely wrong he did it by numerically solving differential equations using something a technique which is today called the euler's method after euler who came some 12 centuries after him but what did he do he used only the elementary rule of three which you use in uh, which you study in primary school if uh, five people do a work in so many days how many days will 10 people do that's the rule of three and it is similar to what is called linear extrapolation or in interpolation that is what aryabhat used and this was all discussed in my book cultural foundations of mathematics there's a copy in the library so please do take a look at it um, it is available there about the transmission of the calculus from india to europe in the 16th century ce all right so uh, i'm not going to go into that ah brahma gop 7th century who criticized aryabhat suggested quadratic interpolation and a return to the earlier thing of six sign values then boteshwar around the 10th century He used both quadratic in, uh, into extrapolation, which is uh, like Stirling, not like it is Stirling's formula, exactly Stirling's formula, not a spot of difference. And he used uh, 96 values to get accuracy to the second sexagesimal minute. So that is Vikala. And now the important thing is that Brahmagupt used polynomial arithmetic, which he called Avyakkanit. And this is non-Archimedean. This is a bit technical. I won't go into that, but non-Archimedean um, means that there are infinities and infinitesimals, and this was what was used by Neil Kant in the 15th century to sum the infinite series. This is the verse from um, Aryabhatiya Bhashya. It's on uh, commentary on uh, Ganit 17. He because the finite geometric series is known from a very long time. You find it in uh, Egyptian this thing also. So the infinite geometric series was summed for the first time in this uh, in Neil Kant's Aryabhatiya Bhashya, and uh, he sums it by using this technique of discarding infinitesimals. Ah, look, this is what happens. The dictation keeps coming up somewhere right, if it is just left on. <laughs> so I am sorry. This uh, this is not to be. Ah, together with the philosophy of zeroism. Please delete this. Just some inadvertent thing has come in because of uh, dictation. I cannot de delete it on the HTML file. With the with zeroism, which is a philosophy of inexactitude. 
So you discard infinitesimal because it's inexact, but it is good enough for practical purposes. The Aryabhat school in Kerala used 11, 12,000 polynomials uh, and got 24 sign values, which are accurate to the. So this is how their sign values are written: Shrestam nam, Varishthanam, etc., etc. And now you'll wonder what has this got to do with sign values? So uh, they are actually accurate to the third sexagesimal minute. These are not Sanskrit terms. This is Katapayadi notation, and it is Kala Vikala Takpara. So Takpara is the third sexagesimal minute. And these are the numbers. Now, what does it, if you don't understand this, let me give it to you in decimal notation. These are the sign values, and this is the difference uh, from accurate values. So as you can see, they are very highly accurate. Okay. So uh, then there is infinite series, the Leibniz series for pi. So you find this, uh, this is the words for it in Yukti Deepika 2.27. And uh, you can go to the uh, translation. So this is basically, this is the, not basically, this is the Leibniz series, which is uh, uh, named after Leibniz on the doctrine of Christian discovery that only Christians should be discoverers. And anybody else who knows it beforehand doesn't count because he's not a human being. He's something less than a human being. All right. So uh, this is what was there. But these precise sine and cosine values, the tables of seconds, as they were called, they were badly needed for European navigation. They were needed for navigation generally to determine latitude, longitude. But Europeans had a special problem of loxodromes. And to determine the size of the Earth, you need the sine values. And this was the major scientific challenge for three centuries before Europe, because all their wealth came from navigation, you know, coming from South America, or from wherever they were all getting their money from abroad and depended on navigation. And therefore, they recognized it's a major problem and the European government offered big prices. And so Cochin based Jesuits stole this knowledge in the 16th century with the help of local serial Christians. They translated them and sent them to Europe, where, of course, they were discovered once they were there shamelessly attributed to Christians. And you know, for example, precise trigonometric values, Clavius wrote a book on it in 1607. Neil Kant's astronomical model was uh, is called today the Tychonic model after Tycho Brahe, whose student was, whose assistant was Kepler. Madhav sign series was attributed to Newton, with Newton claimed it as the discoverer. And that's the one thing he claimed, he didn't claim to have originated calculus, but he claimed that sign series. And the pi series was attributed to Leibniz and so on. And number of things, you know, we've seen Euler's method, Sperling's formula, Fermat's challenge problem, and so on. Even my work on the theft of calculus was itself stolen because it's still happening today. Not a thing you can do to stop it. So this has happened. This is what happened in 2004. Exeter University, this is the headline that you find, uh, George Joseph and Dennis Almeida. The whole news item is about that. It is online. Please take a look at it. And uh, they, uh, they were uh, caught by uh, ethics committee, but they did it again because they said Indians are fools. They will just think, OK, European did it. How can a European copy? How can he plagiarize? They worship European. That's what they have been taught. It was serially plagiarized. And uh, this is there in my. Uh, blog, uh, if you see, there was a huge news blitz three years later. Front pages of all newspapers in India. All right, for example, uh, Hindustan Times and so on. But the point is, not only was it plagiarized, we have enough made jaffers who still want to give credit for them. The same guy was invited by uh, Hyderabad University. He's a mathematical ignoramus because he's made so many foolish mistakes in copying from me. Because all people who copy make foolish mistakes. But they invite him. And nobody, not a single Indian, will take a stand. I think we have to understand that. It works. It can be maintained indefinitely because they think that you are all such great fools that you will never stand up, not even the worm which will turn. OK? So I think that is how it works. But my basic thing I've got is my epistemic test, which I have written on it in popular terms. It is there in my book, of course, but I have written on this uh, how Newton made a mistake or how these people made a mistake. So when one student cheats 
and copies from another, then you he doesn't understand what he's copying. So those who steal knowledge, like students who cheat, so if you ask them questions, searching questions, they don't have an answer. So you can expose. So they don't have a full understanding. And that is what happens exactly in this case. Newton failed to understand the calculus. So he called the derivative a function. What is function? A very foolish idea that time itself flows. Why do I call it a foolish idea? People tell me not to use words like foolish. <laughs> what word should I use? I mean, it is foolish. In the 8th century, Sri Harsh was an Advaita Vedantist philosopher. It's described in my book, Time Towards a Consistent Theory. Uh, he said this is, he uh, destroyed the idea. And it was discovered by Europeans only by McTaggart in the 20th century. And it is called McTaggart's paradox, the basis of the philosophy of time in the 20th century. So uh, fluxions left Europeans puzzled. Descartes to Bishop Buckley to Karl Marx, you no, know, from the 16th century to the, uh, from the 17th century to the 19th century. They did not understand what this calculus is, what is being done. All of them objected, and that is why I've written on this. So, you see, Karl Marx said the he talked of the calculus of uh, Newton and uh, Leibniz as mystical. So, please take a look. And um, this is the point that people did not understand. Newton did not understand, and other people contested it. But now I want to go further because I was talking about science. He did not understand what was the consequence. The consequence was that Newtonian physics failed. It did not fail because it was some empirical result, some experiment. It failed because of its internal incoherence. For Newtonian physics to be even meaningful. See, if you take Newton's laws of, this is discussed in my book. For Newton's laws of motion, uh, you say uh, body stays in its rest or uniform motion in the absence of external forces. What is uniform motion? In order to explain what is uniform motion, you say it moves equal distances and equal times. What are equal times? And Newton didn't define it because he said time flows and God knows what is this even flow of time. He meant it literally. God actually knows and that is good enough because God has made those laws of nature. And in fact, Barrow, who was his mentor, said people who don't know what is a measure of time, they are quacks. He was referring to Augustine. But Newton retracted that thing from by Barrow. So this is an article of mine, Time, What Is It? That is an expository article that I wrote long ago. So it is available also on my uh, website. So you can take a look. He retracted this definition. And now my point I'm making is that Newton's laws hence failed. Because there was no proper measure of equal intervals of time, therefore his laws failed, and they were replaced by special relativity of Poincare 1904, not Einstein 1905, because Einstein copied from Poincare, made a mistake, didn't understand this special theory of relativity. He made a foolish mistake by trying to approximate functional differential equations by ordinary differential equations, which is impossible, explained in the book, explained in many articles. So now the problem is Newton's laws fail, but those laws of motion come as a package deal with the law of gravitation. They are not independent laws. Even Popper talks about it, that um, you can make physical sense out of these laws only when you combine the two. Otherwise, they are not physical. So since they come as a package deal, if Newton's law of motion fails, then Newton's law of gravitation also need to be modified. And this was done. This was done a century ago. General theory of relativity made that modification after special theory of relativity. But now the point is that Newtonian gravitation worked very well within the solar system. We are looking at internal incoherence. And it worked very well because it was back calculated from ancient. And I will, I'm talking about Indian observations because the observations of uh, Parmeshwaran were discovered by Tycho Brahe, who kept them a secret from his assistant, the nearly blind Kepler, who, according to the scandal, murdered him just to get those notes, and then got his job as well. Of what uh, astronomer royal to the Holy Roman Empire. So the point is, anyway, let's get the, set the scandal aside and talk about this. Newtonian physics fails for the galaxy. So take a look at this. 
these are the rotational velocities of stars let us say in our galaxy but these names are given here several galaxies this is true now what happens is in the solar system you find that uh, the velocities of the planets as you go further away they will decline so pluto is moving more slowly because it is further away whether it's a planet or not doesn't matter what you call it doesn't matter but here in the galaxy the velocity increase and they become constant so this is inexplicable now what you do is when a i mean a theory fails you can always save the theory by accumulating hypothesis and that is precisely what is done that hypotheses are accumulated so you can say there is dark matter now if there is dark matter all right one is willing to admit there is dark matter but it must be peculiarly distributed distributed when the luminous matter thins out to zero dark matter must reach a peak why is that furthermore it is exotic matter it's not any ordinary kind of matter so it keeps people busy they can keep talking about all the exotic things but it has not been discovered in the last uh, almost 100 years so grt is not going to make a difference to this because grt differs very little from newtonian gravitation and it is too complex if you want to solve the galactic uh, problem you need to solve a many body problem nobody solved a many body problem in general relativity in a century too complex my retarded theory of gravitation is proposed in this context the minimal modification of newtonian gravitation to take care of the flaw that newton did not define equal intervals of time and so special relativity defines it by saying the speed of light is constant so you need to make newtonian gravitation consistent with special relativity and my theory is much simpler many body problem is solvable question is what is the exact form of the rgt force <coughs> and this question has taken most of my time during this fellowship so uh, there are several possible or observed departures from newtonian gravitation one is the perihelion advance of mercury it's a very tiny effect so it's u square by c square where u is the velocity so it's a u c is the velocity of light so u by c is a very small fraction its square is extremely small then there are uh, galactic rotation curves which are inexplicable i have already said there's a flyby anomaly which was recently observed this is again a v by c effect this is too large for general relativity okay it's a square order order thing which it explains and recently there was this oumuamua where again it seems a u by c effect which is too large for grt so rgt 1.0 which i gave the, the first time this is the initial data if it makes sense to you this this graph galileo 1 galileo 2 near cassini and rosetta and uh, messenger and uh, these are the solution curves in my theory for them which shows a gain of v by c approximately and uh, this is the output table so it's not exact it does not fit exactly but it's very near but now i've been thinking about it so i think that this is um, uh rgt2.0 focuses just on the perihelion advance of mercury and on galactic rotation curves so uh, this involves velocity dependent gravitation effect which are far too large for grt so i'm just focusing on these two it took me a long time to figure that out to work out all the possible formulae and to see which one should go now if people have time i can just go quickly into the pedagogy uh calculus without limits this was a course which was conducted for 10 groups that's the indian way of doing calculus 10 groups in six universities in three countries and it uses aryabhat's numerical method ramagup's non archimedean arithmetic and zeroism or shunyavad which is a philosophy of inexactitude and this has been tried out in several places so central university of tibetan studies and um, then in university of science malaysia so here are some of the reports uh, you can take a look this is on the archive or you can take a look at the graphs of the student achievement there were a post graduate group there was a undergraduate group with applied maths there was an undergraduate group with pure maths and there was a non maths group so these are the four groups which are tried there 
and uh, it's been tried out in various places. It was tried out in Tehran. So here's the poster for that, Calculus Without Limits. And uh, here's the group photo of the Iranians. And uh, it was also tried out in Ambedkar University, Delhi, with social scientists. You see, they are high trend of mathematics. They were able to learn in one week's time. And here's a poster for that. And uh, 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 this is for SGT University. SGT University, which are engineering students. And here's a group photo of them. So uh, this is one part of the batch. And uh, the advantages are that there is conceptual clarity. People don't understand what are real numbers. It teaches real life applications like uh, ballistics with error resistance. Teaches non-elementary integrals omitted from uh, usual calculus courses. And this you can see in a tutorial sheet, for example, for the course. Uh, yeah, these are the Jacobian elliptic functions which are being done. These are non-elementary functions. Here you have uh, ballistics with air resistance and so on. So this is all done over the last thing. And you don't need those formulae which are usually taught as part of the calculus courses which students memorize. Because people don't um, understand anything at the end of 1300 pages of the SPAC calculus text. They don't know a single thing. You just memorize some formulae and some tricks. And for geometry, uh, there was this course on uh, string geometry based on the Shilva Sutra for schools, which is a replacement for the nonsense of Euclid and the related dogmas of civilizational superiority. Now, currently, the way it is taught is that it confounds five distinct and mutually contradictory geometries as one, because Europe corrected it, corrected itself, corrected itself again, corrected itself. We copy everything. The mistake and the correction, and the first correction, the second correction, third correction, and so on. And what you need for practical use, everything, complete scrambled nonsense. So it uh, starts with the religious geometry of uh, Egyptian mystery geometry. There is Plato, there is beauty, mathematics has aesthetics, and so on. And the church interpretation that it is metaphysics. Where do you find the metaphysics? Geometric points are invisible. The invisible means metaphysics, don't exist in reality. Then there's Hibbert synthetic geometry where he corrected is it has axiomatic proofs. So it has a problem. Length measurements are not in, allowed. Geometry, you're measuring the earth, but length measurements are not allowed. It's synthetic geometry. And you talk of congruence instead of equality. The term equality in Egyptian mystery geometry had a political meaning. It's thrown away and you talk of congruence. And you confirm them also with Burkhoff's metric uh, axiomatic metric geometry. See, after the Sputnik crisis, U.S. reformed its syllabus, and the Yale School Mathematics Study Group recommended that that is what should be taught. So we teach it. But we also teach all the earlier stuff that Pythagoras did something, <laughs> Euclid did something, and so on. And finally, we hand each student a compass box, which has got these uh, ritualistic instruments like set squares, which nobody uses, or dividers, which nobody uses, uh, and not a single instrument to measure length of a curved line. So the concept of the length of a curved line becomes extremely complex. You need calculus for that if you want to do it this way. But if you have a string, want pi, I'm able to measure a circle very easily. And that's uh, it can replace all the instruments in the, the, the stylistic compass box. This is something I wrote long ago, which is the Indian rope trick, that everything can be replaced. And you can find this online. This is... Uh, 2007 or something like that. It is local, it is eco-friendly, you know, steel plastic. It is better for practical purposes. You know, if you want to measure the area of uh, agricultural farm, a khet, which has a teddy medi made, it's an irregular area. How are you going to measure it? With the instruments of a compass box, it's a toy. It could be used for navigation, but it has nothing to do with uh, any such uh, practical surveying. So Rajiv Ganit uh, was tried out with four groups, and uh, 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 one was in Nasik. So we have this group here, teachers and students. The other was in Chamrad Nagar. Again, teachers and students. You can see they're quite young students. Then it was done in Gundulupete with only teachers. 
They're all very enthusiastic, but they can't change because it's the government who decides what to change and what not to change. And the teachers are not consulted. So it was tried out in Indore. And this is the poster for that, which talks of, you know, you see this is about invisible points. This is about uh, string geometry of the Egyptians. This is about uh, the kitchen it's a pyramid, how beautifully it is built and so on and how uh, you mix up all these things in the current school text right so that is the poster and there's a group photo this is they are actually measuring doing with their hand because it's empirical okay they want to calculate pi or something they have to actually measure this is what the teachers are doing here and there's some media reports on that uh, which are here something on tv and the Local press was quite happy with that. So you can read this out. Uh, and a draft textbook for class nine is ready. I can perhaps uh, stop with that. Maybe I should explain what this black chap is doing here. The thing is that Af Africans also use string geometry. I just showed you that thing about uh, Egyptians doing it. They were called Hapano. Difficult to pronounce. Hatped down up tea. Okay. And uh, they are perhaps more willing to oppose this nonsense about civilizational superiority because they have experienced the horrors of oppression under racist superiority. So I think I will stop with that. Uh, thank you. I can stop sharing, sharing, stop sharing. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, so questions. Comment, anything. Sir, I am going to ask you 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 जिस तरह की ज्ञान के वी उपनिवेशीकरण और जिसको आप वी ईसाईकरण कहते हैं उसकी जितनी सराहना की जाए कम है मुझे लगता है ज्ञान के दूसरे अनुशासनों में भी इसी तरह की पहल होनी चाहिए आ, मैं मैं इन दिनों जब मैं हिस्ट्री पढ़ रहा था तब मैंने मार्क ब्लॉक का ये कथन पढ़ा कि ईसाईत तो इतिहासकारों का धर्म है विडंबना यह है कि अधिकांश भारतीय अभी भी उसी इतिहास पर आगे बढ़ रहे हैं बहुत बहुत बधाई बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं और अद्भुत मतलब मेरे लिए विस्मयकारिता एक क्षण के लिए भी मैंने अपने को इस प्रेजेंटेशन से अलग नहीं किया बहुत बहुत बधाई धन्यवाद और कोई Or कोई और कोई कमेंट आई वुड लाइक टू आल्सो स्पीक इन द सेम सेंटिमेंट एज प्रोफेसर हारा हैज स्पोकन आई मीन दिस इज एक्चुअली ही पुट्स एक्सट्रीमली profound research in very accessible uh, discourse so that is to his uh, to professor raju's credit um, very simple people like me who have no access to mathematics never had access to mathematics all my life but um, the way he presents his research is um, very uh, very touching and uh, of course everybody knows that he's uh, brilliant i also congratulate him uh, very uh, from the core of my heart and i wish him all the success and finally i would say he himself is the questioner so who can question him so you <laughs> sir <laughs> thank you very much for very excellent and uh, accessible presentation it made it worthwhile for me to get up at five in the morning in came <laughs> and also <laughs> congratulate makran for inviting you to give such a you know such a good presentation and my students have always appreciated your work as you know thank you very much once again 
थैंक यू सचपाल जी सर मैं आई कम इन हितेंद्र पटेल प्लीज 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 सर आई बाउ बिफोर यू फॉर फॉर दिस हिस्टोरिक प्रेजेंटेशन आई वुड से दैट ऑल दो थैंकिंग यू वुड बी द सेफेस्ट ऑप्शन इन दिस इन दिस सिचुएशन एंड से दैट दीज ग्रेट थिंग्स आर टू बी टू बी डन बाय जीरियस लाइक सी के राजू and this is best way out but i would like to engage with the kind of research you are doing and uh, i have a sympathy for your crusade if i may put that way not in a pejorative sense against a particular kind of knowledge which has become so powerful that even if we tend to agree to much of what you are saying not in technical terms but in the spirit we are unable to uh, uh, help you in this in this entire enterprise and uh, 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 later part i could not understand much but the real thing which i understood from your presentation today and even before i in i am in complete agreement with you that a particular kind of knowledge and bias has come into the what is called the knowledge or scientific knowledge in such a way that it's very very difficult to 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 counter it uh, i i remember uh, ashish tanti has written a book intimate enemy i mean the enemy is inside and therefore it's very difficult to 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 even question that i i i'll uh, little bit of what i have understood about the history and that is very very important because in the earlier part you try to provoke historians i would like to say a few words on that it is very true that a, a, a historians are at a sea when we they deal with the bias because we have uh, segreg i mean divided our no historical knowledge in such a way that we as modern historians can only deal with the modern part of it and therefore our sources are so limited our knowledge about the earlier times is so limited that we hardly have anything to contribute but what we can as as modern historians that that the knowledge which was brought in and and that is what you are talking about macaulay onwards and you are very right in saying that it's not in only the case of india or macaulay you should not be blamed it is it is the way of looking at the knowledge and the appropriation of different knowledge of the different parts of the globe uh, that is what you are you are questioning i am not going into the technicalities of it but i i i understand that this this is a serious case for consideration and therefore as professor hada had said it is not merely the uh, it is related to uh, mathematics or science it is related even to if i may say even literature even 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 history so the entire, we we need to um, we need to look into our own disciplines whatever we little we know and uh, and therefore we have to question those parameters we we the way we look at it and last but not the least uh after mekole we have a national tradition of different different subjects and 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 we allowed that kind of knowledge to flourish in india we have nationalist criti nationalist uh, criticism of that kind of knowledge but we hardly have really questioned the basic foundational basis of that knowledge and here you you said uh, in a passing remark something very interesting that uh, baba dismissed uh, kushambi and that is very interesting and we hardly have i tried to uh, find out the sources where from you are saying this and what could be the possible basis of saying so i don't know where, where from you have got it i would just uh, quickly uh, ask you uh, what what okay. could be the source for saying that but let me say at the uh, and at the end that uh, uh, in spite of the disability of ours that we are unable to go with you 
to a distance, but uh, uh, we uh, will wholeheartedly uh, uh, understand. I mean, we can say that what you are doing is in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, regarding Kosambi, Kosambi and Bhava, uh, you have disappeared, uh, Professor Patel. No, no, no. I'm. I'm. <laughs> you're there. Okay. No, if you are, yeah. If the video is on, <laughs> it's much better. <laughs> so I have written an article on Kosambi, the mathematician, where this is uh, considered, and uh, the source actually of Baba's letter. Now it is not available uh, in. You see, the Baba's archives are uh, guarded by the Tata family. And on this side, Nehru's archives are guarded by the Nehru family. So the way Kosambi, uh, we had a common friend. And this common friend had seen this letter. So it's a secondary source. But of course, this uh, is there. And uh, I could not get the primary source. But he uh, commented on it. And I have so many friends in Nobel. I should not say friends, acquaintances in the Tata Institute that, uh, well, now my children are also there. So <laughs> I have gotten to know about this because it's a very old story that uh, uh, Kosambi was thrown out for having published a wrong proof of the Riemann hypothesis. But he was actually thrown out because he objected to the uh, nuclear uh, effort. And there was also a cartoon. It's a very long article, if you could check it out. Kosambi, the mathematician, because he was critical also of Nehru and he was critical of Baba. He was yes, yes. critical of nuclear power. And mm -hmm. Baba was just a rich man's son. He is celebrated as a great scientist, but he didn't know any science. If you see the papers he wrote after coming back to India, they are such trash. It shows you immediately that he doesn't have a basic understanding of the subject. The paper that he wrote for which he is famous, the so-called Baba Hitler scattering, was written along with Hitler, who was a refugee Jew, whom he hired to teach him uh, mathematics and physics, to teach him physics, because he was uh, basically an, wanting to become an engineer. So please take a look. It is a joint paper which he wrote. After coming back to India, he could do nothing. So please take a look at that article on Kosambi, the math mathematician. It's in EPW sometime. Uh, uh, 2008 or 2009, something like that. Oh. And it's also on my website. So you just uh, Google Kosambi the mathematician, you should be able to get it. And it has Thank all you, the sir. details. Right? Thank and you. also the thing. And one more point I would like to make about mathematics. You're absolutely right that there are other subjects which are involved. Now in Iran, we had a long debate on this. Where do you begin? Do you begin with the social sciences or do you begin with mathematics? And um, my point has been that precisely the thing that uh, Macaulay says, that when it comes to the literature, so there's so much of Persian literature, nobody is going to challenge that at all. But so when it comes to sciences, they want to say that you have to imitate us because we are superior. And therefore, you have to start from there. Because in other fields, so for example, psychology, you have Buddhist psychology, you have this, that. But if you want to start from it's a mathematics and science, where you have to start. And that is why I am doing that because I am able to do it. By all means, others should do it. I encourage all the associates who come to do Buddhist psychology to decolonize every possible subject, especially history. Because there is so much yeah. uh, to decolonize in history, right? We need to question and what you can do. See, I've been trying this for the last 30 years. When I was in the institute 30 years ago, I remember going to Sumit Sarkar's house and telling him, why don't you teach? Uh, why don't you start doing something on history of science? Oh, no, we can't do it. We tried and we failed. Now, if you don't do that, you see, you block the effort. You don't allow anybody to do history of science. You say, we are not able to do it, and nobody else is going to do it because your students have to find jobs, and so they will hog all the space in all the <laughs> university departments. So there's no space at all for history and philosophy of science. I have been trying for the last 30 years. It's simply not possible to do it. So I think that historians can do something, that you start doing this effort, so that at least the NCRT won't write that you have to believe whatever is stated in Western textbooks. You can't ask for primary evidence. You can say, we need primary evidence. We can't believe this sort of uh, rubbish without primary evidence. Just as you asked me for a primary search, 
for the letter that Baba wrote to Kosambi, where he made fun of him. He said, you yeah. have plenty of time now to do, follow your uh, interests in history. Okay, <laughs> now that I'm being sad. Okay, thank you. <laughs> May I also speak? Please, please. No, please. In the first instance, I have to say my pranam to you. Bhai Prakat Kripala Dinadayala Kaushalya Hitkari. I have never studied mathematics, but the total conclusion I have drawn from your grand speeches that the Western mathematics have yet to explore a vast area of Indian mathematics. So thank you so much, sir. Congratulations for this magnificent presentation. This is DR Purohit, if you could understand. Yeah, 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 I can recognize. Yeah. Once again, my pranam to you and pranam to Professor M.P. Singh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, a question. Yeah. Uh, Professor Raju, what do you think about hypothetical deductive method? Uh, hypothetical deductive method, uh, you know, logician Wesleyan, for instance, argues that uh, in hypothetical deductive method, uh, axiom axiom and axiom is only the starting point and from axiom you make certain uh, predictive statements and then go to evidence and this part of this part of logic is deduction from axiom to prediction to evidence and from evidence you move in deductive, in inductive, sorry, from axiom, you from evidence, you move inductively to the axioms. And if the evidence provides some support, uh, so you inductively can argue that there is some prediction and therefore axioms do not re remain axiom, they become a uh, proposition supported by evidence. So what do you think of hypothetical deductive method? No, I have no problem with the hypothetical deductive method, so long as you are going to compare with evidence at some point of time. So now I say, let us take uh, the axioms of uh, what you call Euclidean geometry. I derive the Pythagorean theorem. I compare it with real life. I find it is false. So why don't I reject it? So I think that this is exactly what we are talking about, that so long as you have empirical evidence, there is no problem. Number two, when you have empirical evidence, there can be some dispute, there can be some fallibility, and therefore you have to have an inductive method because there can be debate, all right? You have this, whether is there dark matter there or not, some hypothesis has been added on. So I want to know, I mean, you have these, uh, we are talking about uh, the galactic rotation curves. If there is no dark matter, then obviously the theory is false. But uh, anything that you do in this direction, you can always accumulate hypothesis. That is a catch. To save a theory, you can always accumulate hypothesis. You try and resist falsification, as Popper would say by piling on the hypothesis. And therefore, you have to say, first of all, what is falsifiable, which people dodge. So if the theory is falsifiable, it should have been falsified. You know, you have not seen dark matter you know, last how many years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, it's 70 years. It's, uh, it's now actually 90 years, something like 90 years. So you haven't seen it, so reject it. At what stage does it get falsified? It doesn't get falsified, so you can hang on to it. 
So I have no problem with the hypothetical deductive methods, but here we are starting with hypotheses which are not physical hypotheses. When I do calculus, I do real numbers. Of, let's come to simple thing like geometry, invisible points. Now I have an axiom which says that there is a unique straight line between two points. How do I know this? I don't know it because an invisible point is not a fact. So any conclusion that I draw from this is not empirically falsifiable. Mathematics is uh, purely at that level. So when I come to science, I am going to make a concrete physical hypothesis. What am I going to say? I can say an electron is a point. If I do that, your geometry fails because an electron has some spin. So I go around an electron uh, once. I don't come back to where I started. I have to go around it twice. So there are all kinds of problems that occur. Right? In the various ways in which this fails. So the hypothetical deductive method was built because of so much hype about deduction being a superior way of doing things compared to the empirical process. Now I'm saying I want to turn the thing down in Indian philosophy. It is always you start with the empirical, you deduce, but from the empirical. Even Sherlock Holmes says, does he not follow deduction? He praises deduction. He says it's a cardinal mistake to theorize in advance of the facts. So he starts from facts. So if your hypotheses are based on something factual, they are refutable, then there is no problem at all. We are accepting empirical evidence, but they are pure metaphysics, like real numbers, pure metaphysics. And you say real numbers are needed to do calculus, pure metaphysics. Then what happens is that from that metaphysics, you can push in religious prejudices into science. And that is why I wrote that long article about Penrose. Because they are pushing in that, okay, uh, science has proved the truth of Christianity. Singularity, there's a moment of creation and nobody is able to challenge it. So I think this is problematic because in metaphysics, truth can only be decided by authority. There's no falsification. The moment you bring in empirical evidence and falsify, I don't mind. You can start with an hypothesis. I have no problem with that. Provided you are going to meet the empirical evidence at some point and then say this is to be rejected or accepted. Ad admit to that. But if it's pure metaphysics, as it is in formal mathematics, there is no way to disprove it. That is the problem. You have to accept authority. Real numbers are needed for calculus. Why? I'm teaching real numbers without calculus. Some authority says so. Western authority says so. All your textbooks, uh, fat textbooks say so. Who is the CK Raju? He has no social standing. We don't accept him. So this is the problem that occurs that when you come to metaphysics like so-called real numbers, you are only going to decide things by authority. And that proof by authority is not a good idea because that proof is always by Western authority. Do you know of any axiom of mathematics which has been stated by some non-Western? One example. Problematic. It's a method of domination that you want science. If you want science, you want mathematics. If you want mathematics, you have to be subordinate to Western authority. And we don't understand that trick. After even 200 years, we should understand it. I mean, if we can't do anything about it, that's a different matter. At least we need to understand it, that we are being dominated in this way. And as you said, internally dominated. Most people have internalized it. That is the problem. If you are fighting and you fail, no problem at all. Because someday you'll succeed. If you refuse to fight and you support the uh, person who is tormenting you, that is problematic. Who is exploiting you, that is problematic. So come and face facts, no problem. So do you, do you accept any scientific generalization at any point of time? Now your argument, uh, you know, uh, forgive me, I, 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 I don't understand much uh, much of these things but it seems to me that your argument ultimately boils down to make science impossible no, no, no generalization no, no. is possible no 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 i'm making a generalization i'm doing retarded gravitation theory i'm generalizing it to the galaxy i'm saying newtonian physics is wrong so i'm generalizing it to the galaxy and i accept that it is valuable i'm only not saying it is eternal truth I say, okay, I'm making a hypothesis and I'm pretty sure it will be proved to be wrong after uh, some time. So all science is fallible. That is all that I'm saying. I'm a fallibilist. 
I'm not saying don't make a generalization, make a generalization, but with due caution that it is likely to be fallible. So I'm making a generalization that human beings create. So it is not the laws of nature which decide everything. It's also human beings who create living form. All living organisms create things. And that is not taken into account in what I would call Western science because you're talking of laws of nature. You're talking of laws of nature under the influence of theology because Aquinas said, God rules the world with laws of nature. I had given this talk on uh, the relationship to Islam. In Islam, there isn't this belief in laws of nature. Aquinas said laws of nature because he wanted to go against Al Ghazali with Ibn Rush. And so he said that that was a political thing. And that political thing has come into science. And then Hawking says that, well, there is a moment of creation. And then you glorify Hawking. So much propaganda. And then everybody says, oh, he's a great scientist. And nobody understands. When I had this debate with Roger Penrose, 1997, in India International Center, all the people, all the professors of physics from DU and GNU were sitting there. Not a single person understood what he was saying. And he understood that nobody's understanding. So he started pulling, you know, pulling stunts. That's when I knew that he is, uh, you know, he is not above board. That was Penrose. At least he came for a debate. <laughs> At least he came for a debate. At least he had that much confidence in himself that he could stand up and debate. The other people don't even debate. I'm asking for a debate. Uh, you know, the Delhi, Delhi University mathematics teacher, they're debating whether, you know, they teach uh, real numbers or characters. I said, please come and explain in public why you need to teach. They run away from debate. They refuse to debate. I invited them so many times. Please come and debate. <laughs> so they refuse. What can I do? So, <laughs> it is all to be decided secretively. <laughs> this great knowledge, eternal truth, only secretively behind closed doors with you out of the picture. So I'm going to get out of the picture. I don't know, but I want to put all these facts on the table. So at least this story goes forward. There's something terribly wrong in what we are doing. And we need to correct it. And we need to at least sit and decide how to correct it publicly. Instead of just looking at the face of the West, we need to sit and decide. If we think this is good for us, we take it. But we have not even thought of it. We need to have a public discussion the way they have it, for example, in Finland. Whole gathering of people will sit and discuss for two days, three days. Like we used to have this whole idea of Shastrat. Like Shankar debated with, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mandan Mishra. Mandan Mishra. Mandan, Mandan Mishra. Mishra. So we need to have that sort of debate. He was willing to debate even when he was lying on a bed of uh, ashes. I mean, he was <laughs> stuck up to his neck. He was still willing to debate. Now, here, our professor just refused to debate publicly. What do you do? So the whole system of knowledge has been captured. It becomes difficult to change. So that is really my problem. I don't mind people making hypotheses or making generalizations or doing I'm making them myself. I have no problem with that. And the hypothesis could be wrong. It could fail. I have no problem with that either. I'm not saying like Newton, I have got the laws of God, eternal laws of nature. They're not eternal, they're not laws. They're fallible models. I have no problem with that. Okay, any any other comments or questions? One more question, sir. No? One more, just one question. One more Where, question, somebody yeah, has please, a question. Go on, go on. This is DR Puroit. Yes. But your voice is sounding ghostly. I am a real ghost, sir. <laughs> <laughs> In case we organize, Shastrarth Kya Jai. I will international center me to ski jury with the hogi. Are sab as a hai ki wo kapila vatsan ja ki usne ek bar mereko bulaya. ये जो इंडियन साइंस एकेडमी है मुकुंदा जो राजा रमन्ना का निब्यू और उसका वाइस प्रेसिडेंट था उसको बुलाया 
चलो हम ये डिबेट करेंगे ठीक है तो मुकुंदा के आईआईसी में हुआ और वो मेरा बेटा बैठा हुआ था तब तो छोटा था वो स्कूल में था और उसका ये कहना था व्हाट मुकुंदा डिड he never went beyond the history of physics in the 1930s which is what we read in our school <laughs> texts he never engaged he refused to engage sir mamla 20 lakh ka choti moti jury to hogi nahi uski nahi jury koi bhi ho usko recording to kar le ek debate karke aap jury baad mein nikale hai na usme ek record to kar le ki debate hui hai <laughs> जो लोग पढ़ा रहे हैं मेरा ये कहना है जो लोग कैलकुलस पढ़ा रहे हैं और जो पढ़ाते हैं कि उसके लिए रियल नंबर्स चाहिए जो कि दिल्ली यूनिवर्सिटी में कॉलेजेस में हर रोज पढ़ाते हैं ये बात वो कम से कम एक बात तो खड़े होकर समझा दे कि इसकी क्या जरूरत है वो चुप हो जाते हैं एकदम पब्लिकली सुना दे जूरी कुछ भी कहे कोई मेरे को प्रॉब्लम नहीं है रिकॉर्ड कर ले बा उसकी सच्चाई सामने आ जाएगी उनके पास ज्ञान नहीं है उतना करने के लिए उस पूरे डिबेट में आप मंडन मिश्र और उनकी पत्नी को भी हरा देंगे और आखिरी शंकराचार्य थैंक यू सर सर एक सर प्रणाम आपका बहुत अद्भुत आपकी अद्भुत प्रस्तुति थी और हम लोग हम लोगों के लिए बहुत अधिक सीखने का अवसर था आपने एक बार प्रोफेसर राधा वल्लभ त्रिपाठी जी के लेक्चर में आपने एक बात पूछी थी और ये शास्त्रार्थ की मर्यादा भी है कि अगर जो एक पक्ष है वो दूसरे पक्ष को निरंतर आह्वान करता है उसके लिए कि आप आइए और आप अपनी स्थिति को स्पष्ट कीजिए हमारे सामने और दूसरा पक्ष बिल्कुल कोई जवाब ही नहीं देता है तो वो निग्रह स्थान होता है वस्तुतः वो वो एक जिसको अप्रतिभा कहते हैं निग्रह स्थान जो हमारा प्रतिपक्षी बोल ही ना पाए कोई तो उसमें तो निश्चित रूप से उसकी हार जो प्रतिपक्षी है उसकी हार मान ली जाती है तो आपके निरंतर वर्षों और दशकों से इस प्रकार के आह्वानों से प्रतिपक्षियों की ओर से कोई जवाब नहीं मिल पाना या किसी किसी योग्य उत्तर का नहीं मिल पाना निश्चित रूप से आपके आपकी विजय पताका को लहराता है लेकिन इस 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 उन लोगों की के निष्प्रतिभ अनुत्तरता जो है उसको उसको क्या लोगों ने समझा है क्या ये नहीं नहीं बिल्कुल नहीं जी क्योंकि ये आजकल का जमाना जो है प्रोपोगंडा का जमाना है जी तो जी, अगर आप जवाब दोगे और वो जवाब गलत होगा और ये बात का खुलासा हो जाएगा तब लोगों पर असर पड़ेगा लेकिन आप जवाब ही नहीं दोगे तो लोगों को मालूम नहीं क्या हो रहा है अब जैसे मैंने स्टीफन हॉकिंग के खिलाफ लिखा है एक कुछ लेख जब वो मारा था तब मैंने एक कुछ लेख लिखना चाह अब वो एडिटर बोलता है इसको हम वेरीफाई कैसे करेंगे मैंने कहा भाई वेरीफाई कैसे करेंगे मैं ही एक्सपर्ट हूँ हिंदुस्तान में सिंगुलरिटी थियोरी पे <laughs> मैं कह रहा हूँ आप मेरा विश्वास कर लें या फिर दिल्ली यूनिवर्सिटी के फिजिक्स डिपार्टमेंट के हेड से पूछ लें और क्या कर सकते हैं और किसी को तो आता नहीं है तो ऐसी स्थिति में बहुत ही ये प्रोपगेंडा की बात हो जाती है कि अगर जवाब नहीं मिलता है अगर <laughs> अगर देखिए दो पतंग का अगर पेच हुआ तो फिर कुछ फैसला होएगा अगर पेच ही नहीं हुआ वो डक करते जाए तो फिर वो बोल सकता है कि हम तो जीते हुए हैं जी 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 <laughs> इसी तरह से की बात <laughs> जी हमारी इंट्रोलॉजी में भी इसी तरह की विडम्बना है जैसे मूर्ति फाउंडेशन ने बहुत ज्यादा पैसा शेल्टन पोला की इत्यादि को दिया और वो बहुत सारे हमारे बहुत सिंसियर विद्वानों ने उनकी गलतियां जो उन्होंने बताई कि सामान्य संस्कृत में इतनी अशुद्धियां एक रीडर ऑफ द रसा उन्होंने लिखा है रस रीडर उसका पहला श्लोक जो है उसकी ऑर्थोग्राफी जो है उस उसमें अशुद्धि है और बहुत सारी अशुद्धियां जो भारत के सांस्कृतिक पृष्ठभूमि से ठीक से नहीं को ठीक से नहीं समझ पाने के नाते जो अनुवादों में अशुद्धियां होती हैं वो सारी अशुद्धियां उन लोगों के ट्रांसलेशंस में हैं 
लेकिन हम लोग उन्हीं को कोट करते हैं उन्हीं को शेल्डन पॉलक को कोट करती हैं रोमिला थापर और रोमिला थापर को हमारे सारे हिंदी और इतिहास और सभी विद्वान उसी तरह कोट करते हैं बिना किसी कुछ समझे बिना बिना पुनरीक्षण किए उन चीजों का बिना बिना संदेह व्यक्त किए कम से कम उसको मुतनाजे तो बनाइए कम से कम विवादास्पद विषय तो बनाइए उसको बिल्कुल एक स्थापित सत्य की तरह मान करके जो चला जा रहा है और संस्कृत के मूल ग्रंथों को मूल स्रोतों को पढ़ने का कोई तात्पर्य ही नहीं लोग करते हैं उन्हीं के अनुवादों को बिल्कुल एकदम स्थापित सत्य की तरह मानते हैं और जो लोग सिंसियर प्रयत्न करते हैं इनके खंडन का उनका किसी भी तरह का संज्ञान नहीं लिया जाता जैसे रोमिला थापर के शाकुंतलम पर जो वागी शुक्ल ने लिखा बहुत लंबा चौड़ा कि किस तरह से उनकी गलत समझ है इतिहास की और साहित्य की उसका किसी भी तरह का संज्ञान नहीं लिया गया और उनको उसी तरह बदस्तूर कोट किया जाता है तो निश्चित रूप से एक एक राजनीतिक साजिश भी है जिसको इसके प्रति बिल्कुल बात सही है और ये ऐसा करते हैं कि ये ये मैंने जब प्रोबेबिलिटी इन एंशियंट इंडिया कुछ लिखा था तो मैंने छेड़ा था ये हार्वर्ड का कौन जसपाल जी कौन संस्कृत जो है हार्वर्ड में कौन है माइकल माइकल विचर माँ माइकल विचर तो ये माइकल विचर जो है वो कुछ भी बोलने लगा वो कहने लगा कि आपने विल्सन को कोट किया अरे मैंने खुद का अनुवाद किया है विल्सन को कहा कोट किया उसको इतना भी नहीं मालूम विल्सन का अनुवाद देख ले मेरा अनुवाद देख ले दोनों में फर्क है तो इस तरह से कुछ भी वो बोलता है डाइस में आपने कह दिया कि छह होते हैं नहीं थे अरे मैं फाइव फेस डाइस की बात कर रहा हूँ क्योंकि जो अक्षर है वो उसके तो पांच फेस हो सकते हैं तो ये सब कुछ भी अनाप शनाप झूठ बोल दिया और फिर जब मैंने जवाब दिया उसको उसने दबाने की कोशिश की दबा देता फिर मैंने कहा मैं आपको पब्लिकली डिनाउंस करूंगा कि आप मेरे को जवाब नहीं देने दे रहे हो फिर जाके उसने छापा लेकिन छापने के पहले उसने एक माइल लंबा अपने अपनी तरफ से इंट्रोडक्शन दिया <laughs> 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 कोई बात तो ये प्रोपोगंडा का जमाना है और ये प्रोपोगंडा जैसे होता है उसमें आपकी पहुंच कहाँ तक है उसकी बात होती है तो हमको इसके बारे में सोचना है कि जब आपकी बात सही भी है तो उसको प्रोपोगंडा उसको कैसे किया जाए फैलाया कैसे जाए आखिर जब बुद्ध है उन्होंने भी तो प्रोपोगंडा किया फैलाई बात को वो तो फैलाना जरूरी होता है लोगों तक ले जाना जरूरी होता है आजकल खाली बहुत टेक्नोलॉजी हो गई है बहुत उसमें साजिशें होने लगती है बहुत सारा सब कैपिटल इनपुट्स होता है लेकिन फिर भी मेरे हिसाब से सच जो है उसको फैलाया जा सकता है लेकिन लोगों को कुछ मिल काम करना चाहिए वो काम वो बात हमें है नहीं सब अलग अलग इंडिविजुअल स्कॉलर्स काम कर रहे हैं कोई सपोर्ट देने वाला या साथ में काम करने वाला नहीं है जो ग्रुप में काम करते हैं तो वो बहुत कुछ कर सकते हैं लेकिन ये ग्रुप नहीं बनता है जो कि एक दूसरे को सपोर्ट करे जी 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 अच्छा प्रोफेसर राजू मैं एक जिज्ञासु व्यक्ति हूं और ज्ञान प्राप्त करना चाहता हूं तो ज्ञान के मार्ग है लॉजिक ऑफ इंडक्शन लॉजिक ऑफ डिडक्शन इन दोनों मार्गों को आप फॉल्सिफाई कर देते हैं तो फिर नहीं नहीं कौन सा अल्टरनेटिव है नहीं नहीं मैं नहीं कर रहा दोनों को देखिए जो अब हमारे जो न्याय सूत्र में है कि भाई हम प्रत्यक्ष प्रमाण से शुरू कर रहे हैं अच्छा प्रत्यक्ष प्रमाण से शुरू कर रहे हैं लेकिन प्रत्यक्ष प्रमाण उसमें भी गलती हो सकती है तो मानते हैं वो जो रज्जू सर्प न्याय की बात की थी कि भाई मैंने देखा मैंने सोचा वो रज्जू है और वो सांप निकल गया या मैंने सोचा सांप है वो रज्जू निकल गया तो उसको इंडक्टिवली ही उसको किया जाता है करेक्ट तो वो फैलेबिलिटी से हमारा नॉलेज परफेक्शन नहीं चाहिए हम मान के चलते हैं कि हम उसको बार बार करेक्ट करने के लिए तैयार हैं तो प्रत्यक्ष प्रमाण से शुरू करते हैं और फिर उसमें हम अनुमान जोड़ देते हैं तो मैं डिडक्शन भी अलाउ कर रहा हूँ इंडक्शन भी अलाउ कर रहा हूँ कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है मैं खाली कह रहा हूं कि प्रत्यक्ष को मत हटाऊ जो फॉर्मुलर मैथमेटिक्स में हो गया है प्रत्यक्ष को प्रोटॉन प्रोटॉन्स और न्यूट्रॉन्स के प्रत्यक्ष प्रमाण नहीं है नहीं नहीं तो है ना फिर उनको बिल्कुल है कोई भी 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 कोई प्रत्यक्ष प्रमाण नहीं है प्रोटॉन्स न्यूट्रॉन्स के बिल्कुल है लेकिन वो फिर भी वैज्ञानिकों के लिए यूजफुल है नहीं 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 
वो अलग बात है कि यूजफुल है हाइपोथिस यूजफुल है लेकिन मैं प्रोटॉन की बात कर रहा हूँ मैं पहला जॉब मेरा था बबल चेम्बर स्कैनर टाटा इंस्टीट्यूट में काम करता था वो प्रोटॉन को आप देख सकते हो बबल चेम्बर में उसकी फोटो ले सकते हो तो उसके कुछ इनडायरेक्ट इफेक्ट होते हैं वो इनविजिबल है लेकिन इनविजिबल जोमेट्रिक पॉइंट के समान नहीं ये मैंने अपनी किताब में इसका उदाहरण दिया है कि जस्ट बिकॉज समथिंग इज इनविजिबल देर इज नो प्रॉब्लम इट हैज इनडायरेक्ट इफेक्ट तो वो आयन के वो जो जाता है बबल चेंबर में आयनाइज करता है बबल्स बनते हैं तो वो बबल्स को आप फोटोग्राफ करते हैं वो फोटोग्राफ आप देख सकते हैं आप नाप सकते हैं सब कुछ कर सकते हैं वो मैं क्या तो वो इलेक्ट्रॉन ऐसे एक मैग्नेटिक फील्ड लगा दी तो इलेक्ट्रॉन ऐसे घूमेगा पॉजिट्रॉन वैसे घूमेगा प्रोटोन ऐसे बेंड करेगा कम बेंड करेगा क्योंकि भारी है ये सब आप कर सकते हो बहुत ही डायरेक्ट है तो जस्ट बिकॉज समथिंग इज इनविजिबल डज नॉट मेक इट रॉन्ग इट हैज एन इनडायरेक्ट इफेक्ट आपको जो आप स्मोक देख रहे हो आपको फायर नहीं दिख रहा है दैट इज इन मीन दैट इट डजेंट एग्जिस्ट तो आप इन्फर कर रहे हो तो इन्फ्लुएंस इज अलाउड तो आपने उसका बबुल चेंबर ट्रैक देखा फ्रॉम दैट यू इन्फर दैट देर इज एन इलेक्ट्रॉन और प्रोटोन आई हैव नो प्रॉब्लम विद दैट एट ऑल बट यू आर स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम एम्पेरिकल फैक्ट You are not starting from metaphysics. An axiom is purely metaphysics. Point is invisible, but you can't see it. You can't. It has no indirect consequences whatsoever. That is metaphysics. Electron is physics. You can challenge, but it has an indirect consequence from which you can find out where it is, what it is doing. So I have no problem with that. No problem with electrons, protons, even though they are invisible. उसके आंसर में उसके डिस्कवरी में कोई सर्टेंटी नहीं है लेकिन आइंस्टाइन कहता था कि गॉड डिड नॉट क्रिएट यूनिवर्स लाइक गैम्बलिंग गॉड वॉज नॉट प्लेंग गैम्बल Yes. Okay. तो और उसने बाद के जीवन में अपना पूरा रिसर्च इसी पर किया कि क्वांटम फिजिक्स के भी लॉज फुल्ली डिटर्मिनिस्टिक लॉज आर देयर वेटिंग टू बी डिस्कवर इट इज आवर फेल्यूर दैट वी हैव नॉट बीन एबल टू डिस्कवर दैम नो 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 है लॉन्ग टाइम बैक बेल्थ इन जब मैं पी एच डी कर रहा था उस जमाने से फॉल्सिफाई हो चुका है तो ये आइडिया दैट यू कैन हैव हिडन वेरिएबल थियोरी इज गिवन आई मीन देर आर स्टिल सम पीपल हुई ट्राई एंड परस्यू इट दैट्स अ डिफरेंट मैटर बट इट हैज बीन अबैंड और राइट सो आइंस्टाइन वॉज रॉन्ग मेरे से आप पूछेंगे तो मैं कहूंगा वो थोड़ा गधा था ब्रिलियंट मैन तो यूज टू मेक दी स्मार्ट स्टेटमेंट गॉड डज नाई गॉड डज नॉट डाइज गॉड है ही नहीं पहली बात तो वाई शुड गॉड हैव लॉज अरे वो कौन है बैठ के लॉज बनाने वाला हम बनाते हैं दुनिया को लेकिन तो आइंस्टाइन जैसा फिजिसिस्ट भी गॉड में विश्वास करता था अरे वो ऐसा ही फिजिसिस्ट था वो तो सब नकल <laughs> चोरी की उसने स्पेशल थियोरी पोइंकारे से चोरी करी और जनरल थियोरी हिलबर्ट से चोरी करी तो ये पोइंकारे और हिलबर्ट असली मैथमेटिशियंस थे वो ब्रिलियंट लोग थे है ना ये आइंस्टाइन तो आ गया पेटेंट क्लर्क था उसको मालूम था लॉस क्या है आप आइडिया चोरी कर सकते हो आपको एक्सप्रेशन नहीं चोरी करना है तो इसमें लिखा हुआ है मेरी इलेवन पिक्चर्स ऑफ टाइम में पूरा एक चैप्टर है उसके ऊपर कहाँ कहाँ से चोरी किया है वो अपने शुरुआत से उसने चोरी करी तो उसका बस एक हवा बन गया है प्रोपागेंडा हो गया है ये बहुत ग्रेट है हाँ आप कहानी पे मत जाइए कहानी पे मत जाइए गो विद द फैक्ट्स है ना ये कहानी बहुत बड़ी बन गई है प्रोपागेंडा बहुत बड़ा हो गया है बट देर इज नथिंग देर इज नो ट्रूथ इन दैट जो असली ब्रिलियंट लोग थे वो थे पोइंकार हिलबर्ट लेकिन हिलबर्ट देखिए इतना ब्रिलियंट था उसने क्या किया आ, उसने सिंथेटिक ज्योमेट्री बना दी और फॉर्मल मैथमेटिक्स बना दिया ही डिड नॉट रिजेक्ट उसने भी ऐसे गलती करी अब गलती तो सबसे होती है पोइंकार सेट एवरीबडी लाफ सेट अस इज देर नो वी टू अराइव एट द ट्रूथ विदाउट ऑल लाफ्टर दैट वी एंटिसिपेट लेकिन वो जेनुइन लोग थे राइट लोग थे और हिलबर्ट ने कहा आइंस्टाइन के बारे में कि एवरी एवरी से एवरी चाइल्ड और एवरी यूथ इन दी स्ट्रीट्स ऑफ गटिंग नोज मोर अबाउट फोर डायमेंशन ज्योमेट्री 
But do you know why he came up with this uh, novel solution? Because he was so ignorant. <laughs> he just copied it. So that's why I have done this that there is a Newtonian physics mein problem, hai. internal problem, hai, and that needs to be corrected. Hmm. So uh, final final comments aap hi par chhod dete hain final final statement aap kare aur hum log discuss kare hey thank you very much for listening to me so so patiently but i think that this thing needs to be taken forward aur ye jo ncert aise jis tarah se karti hai ki humko primary evidence ki zarurat nahi hai we cannot question the west i think this is something that historians need to protest against that they need to understand that there is a Christian chauvinistic history, not merely Hindu chauvinistic history. So, Christian chauvinistic history ke baare mein kisne baati nahi ki. Aur ye shuvat se khule aam kar raha hai, Mr. 1500 saal se khule aam kar raha hai. We need to talk about it. And we need to correct it. And we need to stop believing something that is handed down to us. Itna kar lenge to bhoat ho jayega. And we need to be responsive to criticism. कि किसी ने क्रिटिसाइज किया चलो हम उसको साइडलाइन कर दें दब जाएगी बात तो दैट इज नॉट वी नीड टू बी रिस्पॉन्सिव टू इट जो शास्त्र की बात कही वी नीड टू रिस्पॉन्ड टू क्रिटिसिज्म नॉट मेयरली सप्रेस इट आई थिंक ये दो चीज अगर हम अपने इसमें ले आएंगे तो बहुत कुछ अचीव हो जाएगा